morning, church. Wherever you are right now, why don't you stand to your feet and let's give God our whole hearts.
Hi ladies, my name is Julia Jack and I have the blessing to share what I learned from the Book of Ruth, Chapter 3. I've always read the Book of Ruth as I do the Bible in general, from my modern viewpoint, through my experience. So the Book of Ruth, to me, has always been a book filled with a type of female pain that I relate to. Which is why, crazy as it may seem, it's been difficult to read and even more difficult to learn from. There is the pain of three women who lost their husbands. There's the pain of a mother's loss of her sons, her only children. There's the pain of a woman in a foreign land, now without the only family she knew from her homeland. And there's the fear of not knowing what to do next. So I read Ruth chapter three through the eyes of a mourning widow going back home without the love of her life and without her babies. And I don't care how old your children get, they will always be your babies. I imagine that Naomi back in her homeland is still grieving the loss of her husband and sons. That type of grief doesn't just go away. I imagine that she's thankful for Ruth's loyalty, grateful that Ruth obeys, even without knowing the intricacies of Naomi's culture or how things work in that society. I imagine Naomi is comforted having another woman by her side who understands her pain. We often talk about Ruth's loyalty, obedience, and what I see as fearlessness and faith in God, in a God who was not hers. I also see these things in Naomi. I see a woman who, in chapter 3, even through her pain, pulled away from her own sorrow to direct Ruth in the ways of her homeland. She didn't teach Ruth bitterness, she taught her action. She didn't teach or model for her how to wallow in her pain and hopelessness, but showed her how to seize the opportunity to be redeemed. In verse 3, Naomi instructed Ruth out of what I see as fearlessness. She had her get dressed up, put perfume on, sent her into Boaz's quarters, and she didn't hold back in fear of Ruth getting hurt by being alone in a man man's quarters at night. If it was my daughter, I don't know if I would have been thinking that way. Naomi wasn't jealous as her daughter-in-law's efforts ended in success in verse 17. And at the end of chapter 3, verse 18, Naomi modeled confidence and faith that she, that they would be redeemed. Naomi never entertained the thought that the life Ruth was about to enjoy was her birthright. You know, women in that day were just as human as we are now. They struggled just as we do. They struggled with self-preservation, jealousy, envy, self-loathing, and other insecure and sinful indulgences of all kinds. You know, if I was Naomi, I too would have called myself bitter. I would have been tempted to allow Ruth to trail along while I focus on me, my kids, my pain, my widowhood, my this and my that. I would have been tempted to focus on what would happen to me as an old woman without a man. What I see in Naomi, however, I would like to model in my life, especially as I get older, to be a selfless example for women in my life. So what so when they're living their diff, so when they're living through their different seasons in life, I can even when I'm in pain or afraid or sad or alone, be steadfast, fearless, and faithful in Christ so I too can be a directive example for their redemption in life and in Christ. This is a story about an immigrant widow's sorrow. It's also a story lined by God's grace, who in concert with the woman's pain, works and redeems when we selflessly and fearlessly participate. Thank you for listening. Stay safe, healthy, and positive. My word for 2021 is fearless. Patience. Consistency. Commitment. Lead. Yield. Patience. Grace. Worthy. Change.
humility. Enjoy. Perseverance. Joy. Consistency. Love. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this fourth phrase, loyal love. It translates the Hebrew word chesed, which is hard to translate into any language because it combines the ideas of love, generosity, and enduring commitment all into one. Chesed describes an act of promise-keeping loyalty that is motivated by deep personal care. Like in the story of Ruth, Ruth is a foreigner married to an Israelite man, but tragically her husband dies along with his brother and his father. All Ruth has left is her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, who has nothing to give her. Naomi tells Ruth she should go back to her people, but instead, Ruth promises to stay by Naomi's side and take care of her. And as other people watch Ruth keep this promise over time, they call it an act of chesed. Notice that Ruth's chesed is not conditional or based on Naomi's worth. Rather, it's an expression of Ruth's character. She just is a generous and loving person who keeps her word. That's chesed. Now, Ruth's loyal love is truly inspiring, but the one who shows the most enduring chesed in the Bible is God. Like in the story about Jacob, who is a treacherous liar even to his own family. But despite that, God chooses him and repeats the promise he made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, that he would have a huge family through whom God would restore his blessing to the nations. And so 20 years later, when Jacob realizes how undeserving he is, he says to God, I'm not worthy of all the chesed you've shown me. And he's right. But God's chesed was never about Jacob's worth in the first place. It's a display of God's generous loyalty to his promise. God's chesed continues into the story of Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. When they're enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, we're told that God remembered his promise to Abraham and Jacob, so God defeats Egypt and raises up Moses to liberate the people and lead them into the promised land. And in the story, this is called an act of chesed because it was about God keeping his word. Now, on their way to the promised land, the Israelites are scared of the nations around them and they doubt that God can protect them. So the people threaten to kill Moses and appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt. God is understandably hurt and angry, but Moses steps in and says, forgive the sin of these people because of your great chesed. Notice that Moses asked God to forgive, not because the people deserve it, but because it's consistent with God's own character. And God agrees, and he recommits himself to a people that don't want to be committed to him. In the Bible, God is loyal and loving for no other reason than it's just who God is. Of course he wants his people to respond with chesed in return, but even when they don't, God's chesed remains. The prophet Hosea compared Israel's chesed to a morning mist that's here one moment and gone the next. But God's chesed is enduring. Like in the celebration of Psalm 136 that opens by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and then 26 times repeats, his chesed is forever. And so, after centuries of Israel betraying their commitment to God, and after humanity's long history of violence and death, God still kept his promise in a dramatic and drastic way by becoming human and binding himself to us in the person of Jesus. And the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth said that in him they encountered the God of Israel who is full of loyal love and faithfulness. Jesus is the ultimate loyal and loving human. And in his life, death, and resurrection, God opened up a new future for all of us and for all of creation. And God did this because it's just who God is, generous, loving, and eternally loyal to his promises. And when we experience the 
purity and power of God's loyal love shown through Jesus, it compels us to reimagine why and how we can show chesed back to God and to the people around us. This is what it means to say that God is overflowing with loyal love. Dear God, thank you so much for tonight, God. Thank you so much for these women. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to be able to dive deep into your word, to just see all of the beautiful ways that you love us through the book of Ruth, God. Um, help us have open hearts, open minds, and open ears to learn, um, to share, to hear tonight, God. I'm so grateful that we get to come together. I'm so grateful for um, you allowing uh, women to come and learn from you um, and see see your sovereignty and see the way that you fight for us. In Jesus' name, I pray to you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, ladies. Welcome to Midweek. I'm so excited to be able to virtually be together here with you guys. We've had a packed midweek so far, as you can see, but we hope you've had fun so far. Um, we're looking forward to our discussion tonight. And um, as you can see, there's only the three of us tonight. Sam has given us free reign. Don't worry, we'll, we'll keep it in, in the bounds. But we are so excited. Um, we miss her, of course, but we're so excited to be able to lead you in discussion um, as we continue in our study of Ruth. And as you know, we are studying out Ruth four uh, and tonight, but just verses one through 13. So next week we'll be doing 14 through the end of the chapter and doing a wrap up of all the things we have learned. But for tonight, our focus will be Ruth four verses one through 13. And I just want to say a quick thank you to Julia. Thank you so much for sharing, for sharing your perspective on, um, on Ruth three. I know it's been so fun to have those videos. Um, of different women in the church sharing what they're learning um, and then continuing to discuss what we're all learning in our discussion groups. Also, sorry, I have my notes down here. Also, um, wasn't that YouTube video cool, guys? It, it, yeah. it, we kind of came across it and it, it just felt like God was speaking to us, like we have to show this video. So um, just like the video mentioned, talked about Hesed, I can't say it the cool way he said it, I've been trying, but um, but Hesed, right? There we go. Um, <laughs> but that's going to be our one word, like just like we had all the women share or many of you share your one word for 2021. We really feel like God has made it clear that Hesed is the focus for chapter four, but also mm -hmm. ties in to our focus for 2021 as a church being mm -hmm. love your neighbor as yourself. So all that being said, we are all going to share different aspects of the chapter that brought out Hesed for us. So I'll go first since I'm already talking. <laughs> um, one of the places that I saw Hesed and it really stood out to me is in the first few verses when basically it's talking about the interaction between Boaz and the kinsman redeemer who is closer um, in relation to Ruth. And as I was reading, um, and even as I was watching the video that we just watched, I what stood out to me was that Hesed is a choice. It's not simply something you don't accidentally fall into living in Hesed. Um, mm -hmm. God doesn't accidentally show us Hesed. Um, you know, you can't accidentally love your neighbor as yourself in a way yeah. that mirrors has said. And even in this, in these verses, um, the first few, you can really see that because there was another kinsman redeemer who was closer in relation, who had every chance, was trained up in the same law, who knew the, the law of the Old Testament, who knew about, you know, Deuteronomy 25, um, what, what it said about, about, you know, um, continuing the family line and, and, you know, um, the kinsman redeemer law, but he chose not to redeem it. And actually, if you, if you read the interaction, you see at first he said, okay, I'll do it. And then when he realized the sacrifice, he decided not to. So even that it, it, it made me realize, oh, wow. Like in my own life, um, has said again, is a choice. I have to be intentional and I'm going to come to a crossroads at some point when I'm going to decide, am I going to sacrifice and am I okay with the sacrifice I need to make to truly show has said to yeah. others in my life as God has done for me, or am I going to turn the other way? Cause the sacrifice is too great. And, um, what I love obviously is that, 
um, throughout the whole book of Ruth, but specifically in chapter four, Boaz knew the sacrifice and decided, made it a, made a choice to continue to show his head. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, God in the Bible made many sacrifices, the greatest of which being Jesus, um, in order to show his head. And it really has gotten me to think more about what kind of love I'm showing to my neighbors. And if if I'm really being intentional and if I'm getting to that point where the sacrifice becomes real and I'm deciding to go forward and live in his said, or if I'm turning away. Um, so that's something that stood out to me. Do one of you want to share what stood out to you? Well, I actually wanted to say something on what you commented on because oh, yeah. it's, you know, there's no judgment on the first kinsman redeemer, right? Like he, he, he was kind of like Orpah in that sense, like he knew the law and like in the scripture, it says that if he were to take on not only the land, because that land prospect was like, oh, yes, yes, yes. I want to definitely increase my wealth. But then when Boaz mentioned Ruth and Naomi and like all the other things that were also going to come with that, he was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. If I take <laughs> on another wife and like more kids and I'm going to put my I'm going to put myself in jeopardy because obviously he has a wife and sons that have already been promised an inheritance. So now you're talking about dividing that up. And he's like, Oh, like that's, that's a bit much, you know? And so in the same sense with Orpa, you know, initially she was like, yes, I'll go with you. But then she had to really think about it. Like, Hmm, this, this is a lot. It's, it's too much of a sacrifice for me right now. And so I do appreciate even the grace in that, like, where in that moment you see that once he really thought about it, and I think that was a choice too, right? Like he considered it and he realized, no, that's too much. And it just really opened up and really just really uh, showed God coming in. Cause you're like, oh no, what's going to happen to Ruth and Naomi? Like there's just this buildup and it's like, God has a plan, right? Yeah. Like, and so I think despite what we do or what we don't do, like God's will is going to happen through whomever. And the great thing about Chesed Oh, nice one. I've been working on it. I've been working on it. That's what I work everybody. Get the, you know. Um, but the great thing about that is we also get to choose to be a part of an, an incredible adventure. And one in which will require sacrifice, but it's an adventure that God himself was willing to go on with us, right? But it's like, it's just, there are just certain things you won't experience in life mm-hmm. and, and certain aspects of God's nature, and any, even in your relationships that you won't experience without making that choice. And so that's what yes. I really see in Boaz is it was an incredible sacrifice because as, as far as we know, Ruth is barren. So it's not like, yes. oh. it, it, right. He's taking on a wife and, and, and not knowing what's going to happen, but he was just so overwhelmed with the opportunity to show his set. And so I just really appreciate that, that faith, that reckless abandonment um, in that decision. So yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to comment on that. I just thought that was really cool. Can I share? Yeah, uh, thanks. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, as you were talking, Aisha, I was like, man, yeah, like Jenny had said, it just reminds me of Jesus, right? Like, here's Jesus, you know, at, you know, at, in whatever form he was in heaven <laughs> um, <laughs> with God, you know, like, he doesn't need to disrupt his eternity. He doesn't need to disrupt, you know, his holy reign. But yet he kind of like Boaz chooses, you know, to show his loyalty to us and his love by coming down and sacrificing and, 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 and taking us who in a lot of forms are in a lesser form than him, right? Yeah. Like we're the foreigner, we're the outcast. And so I, I, as you were talking, I was just thinking, wow, that's so beautiful because it does illustrate. An, uh, and that's what I think Hased does, right? It illustrates God, wherever it is. When you show Hased, you show some form of who God is. And so I just love to see that through Boaz and that choice and to see like, right, like um, there's places where we could be rejected, but with God, like he has, he's shown us his, his said by choosing us, even if it does seem, you know, in some ways it could taint his um, reputation or whatever, or his mm-hmm. standing. He's like, no, I'm going to do what's right and love them. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, my, the part that stood out to me is like right after what you had talked about, Jenny. So I'm going to read um, Ruth chapter four, it's verse 11. And it says, and this is after Boaz, you know, comes through and decides to redeem. It says, then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing and Ephratah and be famous in Bethlehem. Okay, so 
I'm not going to lie. When I heard the people saying that they were hoping that, you know, Ruth would be like Rachel and Leah, I was like, mm, I don't know. Because when I think about that relationship dynamic between Rachel and Leah, you know, what I see is a lot of manipulation. I see a lot of competitiveness, um, like infighting in their marriage and their relationship and so much dysfunction of favoritism and deceitfulness. And, and so I'm like, is that a blessing that they're saying that they want Ruth to be like Rachel and Leah? And, and I think what stuck, stuck out to me, and I think even as we're studying the book of Ruth and learning more about God's has said is, it's not about the characters. It's not about the individual people. Because when we look at the ind individual people outside of the story of God, that is all we see, right? We're like, oh, what a mess, you know? And how, how, is, how is this gonna work out? And that's where the second part of the verse really brought me back to that point because it said who together built up the family of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it made me go back to that promise, right? The promise was for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it was to make their descendants as numerous as the stars. And God chose to work through flawed, sinful people to fulfill that promise. And really, ultimately, yeah. it goes back to even what the YouTube video said about God being a loyal love and keeping his promises, yeah. despite, you know, people's flaws and mistakes. And, um, and I was like, wow. So in that moment, I saw Hesed because mm -hmm. God worked through Rachel, God worked through Leah, and now God's going to work through Ruth, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to be a part of that story and that history. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, the part of his set I saw. And then I had, um, obviously this was a quote in the YouTube video, but I loved this because I felt like this, this is really the heart of the book of Ruth, but also the Bible. And he said, the one who shows the most enduring has said in the Bible is God. Mm -hmm. And it's just like yeah. time after time, story after story, person after person, you really do see God's faithfulness, God's promises, and God's has said throughout the whole thing. Yeah, that's so true. Can I add something really quick before yes, Manuel goes? When you were talking and even thinking about that, like there is no Hesed without God. It, and that's like pretty amazing. And it reminded me of um, in John 13, 35, by this, um, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, that that's really true. Like without God's Hesed, or with God's has said, that's what changes the world. And that's what makes us stand out without God's has said, we're just flawed people making a bunch of mistakes and not loving people the way God calls us to. So anyway, it reminded me of that. And again, it just kind of ties everything together. So yeah, I love what you shared. Yeah. I definitely think that has said is countercultural. Like I think it goes against the grain. Like I think there's elements to has said that can be, um, like seen in our society where like people are nice, you know what I mean? Or people are like, you know, me, even me and Siobhan the other day, like we, our car battery died and um, it was easy to find someone to like jump the car for it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like we asked people and it was really heartwarming, right? It was super encouraging. Um, and so I think those nice everyday things like are things that we can do for people, you know, saying hi to someone, someone drops something, we pick it up, those things, you know, but I think like his said calls a little higher, a lot higher. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's not just about a momentary kindness. It's not just about like a small showing of like an appearance of love. Like there's an enduring, like nobody would fault you if you backed out of this situation, <laughs> um, a loyalty to the love that is shown. And I definitely feel like God sets the bar um, and sets the example for us because I think Hesed says stay in love when society mm -hmm. says you might want to just leave that alone, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think you wow. see that in all of, all of you guys' example as well. And as I was reading through Ruth um, and I was getting to the end right after what Aisha shared, I looked at how the, um, the elders um, at the gate basically referred to to uh, Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. And I was thinking about Tamar, cause I don't know, you know, for you guys out there, if you've ever read the story of, of Tamar in, in Genesis 38, but it really um, is the story kind of similarly of this Canaanite woman, right? Like this foreigner woman in some forms, like um, who comes and is with, and, and has a son, right? Like she has a son with, uh, she has, she's married to Judah's uh, son. Right. So first she has a son, um, heir or er, I don't, I'm not sure how to say it. Um, and then he dies. And so then customarily she marries um, 
the brother and then the an onan then he would never um he wouldn't allow their relations to take place in this in a way that she could get married you can read about the details <laughs> 38 how he uses some form of birth control but um <laughs> he doesn't allow that to happen but in every situation like because if you look at it look at the story with er or air er, like he was it says that god saw him as a wicked man which I imagine, and, and for any of you married women out there, know that like um, a man who's not loving God is not a man who often, if, if God sees him wicked in his sight, I can imagine that him as a husband to her wasn't really a, a very like great time for her, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and you know, um, or you can, you could try to understand that having a, a wicked husband makes life a bit hard. And then here she goes tomorrow again, and then she has Onan who won't give her a child and and who sleeps with her but spills his seed you know like every time and so he's still not allowing her to have a son or for her family to prosper and I just can imagine you know what kind of mindset that that comes from so God punishes him you know like each time God punishes these men and and then finally um though you know her methods you know might seem questionable um oh even Judah was supposed to give her his last son. And then that didn't happen. And so then, you know, even though her methods seem questionable and bold, she works it out to have a son with Judah. And Mm -hmm. I think that what I see is God's has said with Tamar, because she's a widow. Can you imagine twice? She's a widow in a society, you know, that doesn't really feel the need to look out for her. And I feel like every time God comes through faithfully, you know, like loyally to protect her and to be there for her through different methods. And even when all the men, in her life don't look out for her and all the men in her life like let her down time and time again god is always there you know in whatever timing to make sure that she's okay because i think we can all relate to feeling either let down or forgotten by a man some man at some point in our lives some powers some authorities in our lives feeling like they didn't look out for us and so i love to see that and then when you bring it back to ruth we know that we've seen that in this story you know we know that societally ruth was an outcast a foreigner in 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 this society but she could have come in and been totally outcast but she allowed god to be god in her life and look at where the story is taking her because just like um Tamar, Tamar, like, and Rahab, who's Boaz's mom, like, all of them, situations where God looked out for them when society didn't, they all end up being in the lineage of Jesus, right? Like, they all end up having this historic place um, in in the line of Christ where they'll always be remembered. Like, you know, like, their stories will be told generation to generation, and they were women who should have been forgotten. And so I think that Mm -hmm. just is a reminder to me. That's, That's what really stuck out to me was this idea of, like, you know, like, I don't, I don't let society define what's going to make me be like amazing or stand out or, or known, like, because God is there, you know what I mean? Like, and even if the people or the authorities in my life don't look out for me, that doesn't have anything to do with the way that God has plans for me as a woman, you know, and us as women, and just holding on to that, you know, whether we have loss, um, hurt, you know, whether from our spouses or our ex-spouses or, you know, whatever, you know, the men or, or whatever authorities in our lives, we can always trust that God, God has said, will stand with us. His loyal love won't leave us, even if other mm. people can't find it within themselves to, to give us that has said. But I just really, that really stuck out to me when I thought about that story. And so interesting that they would reference that because it's kind of similar in that, in that framework. Yeah. Mm, preach. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> I actually wanted to bring it back to something you said, Jenny, about, you know, our theme for the year as a church, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And I just thought about something that I see in this part of Ruth is how uh, I think has said was meant to be kind of like overflowing, like this perpetual thing. Um, God continuously gives and gives and gives over again, despite, you know, the circumstance, like people don't earn it. They don't deserve it. It's just his nature. And I think about how inspiring that is and how it has this ripple effect. So we know that the people were inspired by Boaz's act of chesed, but we also know that Boaz was inspired by Ruth's act of chesed, which she was at the threshing floor. And so even as we think about how can we live and choose to live in chesed, it's not meant to stop with us, right? Like when we truly have experienced God's chesed, there's this, this, 
desire in us to go above and beyond the law. And I think that's the hard thing is it's not something that someone's going to tell you to do, right? We all know what the law is. We, we can all do the bare minimum, mm-hmm. but that's not what makes it amazing. And that's not really what makes it God, you know? It's the fact that they were willing to do and sacrifice and go above and beyond that, that really showed God's character and God's nature. And that's, that's the challenge that we're having right now for ourselves is how can we go above and beyond in loving our neighbor as ourselves? So we have some questions for you all you, uh, for your discussion groups. So we're going to have discussion groups at the end of the month. There's so much more to the chapter that you can dig into and look at. But here's some questions to kind of prompt you as you do that. So the first question is, what is a promise in the Bible that you've seen God keep in your life? So we talked about how God is that faithful love, that promise keeper. What's a promise that you can think of in your life that God has kept? The second question is, how have you seen Jesus's loyal love? So, you know, ultimately God demonstrates his, his said through sending Christ. And how do you see that, that loyal love? And then the third question is, how can you show has said to your neighbors? So, yes, that's the question. Yay! <laughs> we love you all. <laughs> yes, thank you for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of the week and enjoy your discussion groups. Bye. Bye.